Good afternoon, distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion on this ongoing fourth Columbia-India Summit with the theme, India Rises. I must say that during this conference, I'm, Professor Panagia, I'm very impressed with the brain power you have collected here. Um, I'm kind of intimidated because I am just a humble journalist who is not an expert of anything, just learn from other people uh, and listen to them. So my panelists uh, for the session today are two extremely distinguished academic luminaries and economists of repute. You all know Professor Arvind Panigriya, who you, um, and Professor of Economics, and the Jigdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Pol Political Economy here at Columbia University. He is equally well known in India now that he, he has come back to serve the country uh, of his birth as the chairman of the 16th Finance Commission. The Finance Commission, which dates back to 1951, defines the financial relationship between the central government and 28 states and eight union territories of India, is a constitutional body that recommends the allocation of, res of revenue resources. The second panelist with us today is also a very distinguished academician and economist, Dr. Amartya Lehri, who is a professor at the Vancouver School of Economics and at the University of British Columbia, is a product of the famous Stevens College and the Delhi School of Economics. Dr. Lehri's interests involve a macro and microeconomic developments of India over the past three decades, but he says, he says they keep changing. There couldn't be a more distinguished panel to debate what is a very thought-provoking theme. When Professor Panagreya first wrote to me inviting me for, to chair this session, I was intrigued with the title at first. India towards the old normal evokes surprise as the usual response would be to look ahead instead of looking back. But what emerged from me, uh, but after thinking it over, it became a deeper meaning, and uh, I hope that we're able to do justice to this theme. Imagine the theme, or uh, I think I was kind of informed that the theme is, is uh, around a recent lecture by, uh, by Professor Panagria on the subject of India's economic ascendancy worldwide in the next 50 years. In that he said, and I quote, for a staggering one and a half millennium, India was the largest economy in the world. Subsequently, China overtook India, but two, economic, two economies remain the world's largest until recently as 1870. If this was a reality, then India today finds itself at a pivotal moment in history. A republic that is 75 years old, but a civilization whose discovered origins were more than 7,000 years old, and by some estimates, even older. Today, with India becoming the world's fifth largest economy and on its way to becoming the third, the question is, as India rises, can it rise to regain the past economic stature and consequent political and strategic, he uh, strategic heft? How would this come about, if at all? I know that Professor pa uh, Panagria has mulled this over and other related questions. I'm sure he will answer that in his lecture today. Once Professor Panagreya speaks, uh, uh, we will also get to hear from the other distinguished expert on the panel, Dr. Lahiri, who is uh, recently, as January this year, wrote that some of the discussions on where India's economy is headed and, uh, and how it may achieve the desired development goals, as he put it, is unfortunately a distraction. So we get to hear from him what he actually means by that. So hopefully, the old normal will take root as new India takes shape. So without any further ado, let me invite Dr. Panagria to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Puri. Uh, thanks for that very generous introduction. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, the last I saw Mr. Puri was on the television when he was uh, chairing the session of uh, Prime Minister Modi. And uh, he um, sort of started off by saying, uh, telling Prime Minister Modi that, uh, uh, you know, the way the campaign is going, uh, it looks to me that you're already planning for 2019, 2029, and, and this is not about 2024. To which uh, Prime Minister Modi reacted by saying that, you know, you are thinking uh, 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 only about 2029. I am actually thinking of 2047, uh, which was India at 100. Uh, so I really pushed that a bit further, uh, and, and I want to talk about India at 125. Um, that uh, uh, I'll, you'll see why why I choose that uh, India why why I come to India at 125. I'll connect that in a minute. <clears throat> but to start with, I you know these are some numbers um, uh, showing the shares of uh, some of the major countries uh, in the global GDP, uh, uh, starting from. Uh, the first millennium at the beginning of the of the first millennium uh, uh, CE. So it's one CE where India had a sh more than 30 percent share. So India is shown that India's share is shown by the blue line, uh, the, the blue part of the of the bar. So look at the first bar at uh, on on your on the left. Uh, India is is more than 30 percent of the global GDP. Uh, and this story remains, uh, it falls to a little below 30 uh, percent a thousand years later, uh, a little bit further down, but you know, till 1500, clearly India is one of these two largest economies. It's actually, it is, the sec it is the largest economy for the 15, uh, for a staggering 1500 years. Uh, even as we get to 1700, India remains uh, at, at as large as, as China, probably a tiny bit larger. 1820, China becomes larger, but India and China together remain uh, the two largest economies, and that's true even a, a, till as late as 1870. Now, then, of course, you know, we get to the British uh, rule, when, uh, and also the Industrial Revolution takes hold, uh, uh, which really changes the picture quite dramatically, and the shares of both India and China really shrink uh, uh, quite dramatically, etc. So, so the the 200 years that have passed since then have have turned around uh, uh, these these shares. Uh, uh, India particularly has become uh, much smaller relatively. It's now beginning to rise back, uh, uh, but uh, uh, and, and China has 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 come to come to be the the second largest now. India today has, uh, 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 you know, having first shrunken quite dramatically, if you go back to, you know, by 1950 or 1947 when you became independent, uh, the, the share had uh, really become uh, in low single digits. Um, in last 20 years, India has uh, begun to sort of steadily recover its share, and, and today uh, we are the fifth largest economy. Uh, Within three to four years, uh, we will become the third largest. Uh, we are uh, preceded currently by uh, Japan and then by Germany. Uh, so the current ranking is, is the uh, United States, China, Germany, Japan, and India. Uh, in, in another three to four years, uh, we would cross $5 trillion, and we would also cross Germany at that point. Uh, how is this going to unfold in, in, in the uh, and next several decades. Uh, that is where the kind of uh, uh, my, my discussion will, will begin. Uh, and then I want to come back to talking a bit about uh, uh, why I think my story, as I'm going to, um, as I'm about to tell you, uh, uh, has a good chance of uh, unfolding in that manner. Uh, uh, but then I also want to talk a bit about the challenges that India still has to face before we can get there. So that is my plan. Um, now, at present, uh, the United States growth rate, if you look at the uh, you know, last, you can go to three, four decades almost, uh, steadily the United States economy has been growing at about 2% a year. 
China, on the other hand, had grown for uh, three decades at least uh, at 10% uh, or thereabouts. Uh, in the fourth decade, so you know, you get 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, and then the 2010s, it begins to slow down. Uh, it's, it's down to about 6.7 or 6.6%. Uh, so the 10% the, the kind of growth that China was experiencing has fallen. Uh, and uh, uh, nevertheless, that is faster than the United States. Uh, and if it maintains certain, you know, anything that's about 2%, uh, 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 it will eventually catch up uh, with, with the United States. It'll cross. Um, assessments are uh, uh, my own as well as some others that, you know, this should happen by 2040 or so. Uh, China should cross, would cross, co cross the United States. Uh, that is so, you know, exactly when that happens is, is not so much uh, relevant to the story I want to tell. Uh, sometime it will happen. Uh, and sometime, meaning, you know, two decades, three decades from now, it will happen. Uh, that, of course, means that India's race ultimately becomes with the United States. China would already be quite farther ahead. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, to, to get back to the, what I call the old normal, right? So this is, this is in the title. Uh, of, of, of the talk, uh, this old normal that is referring to the fact that uh, uh, the normal used to be that India and China were the two largest economies in the world, and are we going to restore that same old normal? If that is to happen, of course, India will have to cross the United States at some point. Um, my calculation, so I'll give you some numbers here. So this is the the last about 20 years, 2002 to 2022, the United States, followed by China, uh, then Japan, then Germany. But in the last year, although Japan was until 2022 larger than Germany, in the last year, Germany has crossed Japan. Uh, 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 and, and then India is below the, both of those. So that's where we are. Um, and I've already told you that in three to four years, uh, India will cross both Japan and Germany. Now. What uh, 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 do we expect uh, in, in, in the years to come, in the decades to come? This is a table that basically, the one from which I draw uh, some of the uh, lessons uh, for getting to what growth uh, uh, trajectory both of China and India might look like. These are the four, large, four economies which have grown the fastest since the Second World War. Uh, uh, these are all developing countries, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, and China. Uh, these are economies that have actually managed to grow at 8 to 10% for three decades. Uh, a bit of a superhuman kind of growth. But you also see that you know, after you have grown at that kind of rate for three decades, uh, you join the human race. Growth rate declines uh, at that point. Uh, how much it declines in the fifth decade, in the fourth decade, depends on how well you did in the first three decades. So, for example, uh, you know, Taiwan really grew very rapidly in, in the first three decades. Uh, so, it fell below six percent in the fourth decade, and then below five percent in the uh, sixth, uh, in the fifth decade, and three percent in the sixth decade. Uh, South Korea. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, it, it, it grew quite rapidly, and, and it, it shows very similar kind of pattern. Singapore, in the first three decades, grew a tiny bit slower, and so in the fourth decade, it could still grow at 7%, but it, in the end, you come to the sixth decade, and it has fallen to 3%. I suspect that's what, uh, where we, we will see China go. Uh, India, on the other hand, has not had this kind of trajectory. India has grown uh, uh, about you know uh, seven percent. You would say a um, little below seven, actually, if you take the full two th uh, full last two decades. Um, with, uh, 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 these are not normal decades. You had at least two crises happen during this period: the global financial crisis and the COVID crisis. Uh, in addition, of course, India had also its own crisis about which talked in the morning, which which was the uh, uh, the non-performing assets crisis, the banking crisis. So in spite of all that, because a lot of the other policies were put in place, good policies, uh, market-friendly policies were put in place, 
uh, it could still, over the two decade uh, uh, period, uh, grow about 6.5% average rate. So that's a very substantial growth, not quite like, like what we have seen for uh, these uh, four other countries. Um, in dollar terms, of course, the growth rate has been faster. Uh, 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 almost um, another uh, one and a half percent faster. So if you if I do the growth rate of India in 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 nominal dollars, it's about over the same period 2002 to 2022, uh, 2003 to 2022, 20 years, uh, it's 10.2 percent nominal dollars. If you deflate that by the U.S. GDP deflator, which is about 2.3 percent over the same period then the growth rate in real dollars comes out to 7.9%. So it is still fairly substantial growth once you look at this growth rate in real dollars. Uh, that is the point at which, uh, 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 that is the point I, I, I take as my starting point that, that given the fact that India has not grown as rapidly as these other countries, what that translates into is the, the per capita income in India is still low, $2,500. Um, the scope for growing rapidly uh, uh, for many more decades to come uh, is very significant. And so this is where I sort of do this very mechanical exercise first, uh, 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 and obviously that you know, moves away from that, ignores whatever external crises that might happen over this period and all. So, uh, uh, and it's very stylized kind of uh, exercise to do. But I say, well, for the next two decades, we'll continue to grow at, in real terms at about 8% in real dollars. Uh, and then after two decades, we'll drop to about 5%. So this is just back of the envelope kind of exercise I did. Uh, uh, and, and quite to my surprise, actually, and this is, uh, uh, it, it turned out that exactly at 2072, which is under 25 years, uh, it turned out that India would cross the United States. So that is where the restoration of the old normal. Uh, that, I think, is, is the stylized story that, that, that uh, uh, this, this paper uh, uh, tries to tell. Uh, and, and the rest of what I want to do uh, is to briefly talk about why I think uh, India's prospects to do to achieve this kind of growth, uh, assuming that the world remains normal, of course, you know, if the uh, uh, world uh, uh, becomes very abnormal, uh, uh, a, a, a conflict arises in which India uh, uh, somehow gets embroiled, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 that could happen in our neighborhood, uh, uh, certainly if China were to uh, 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 move on uh, to, the, to, to, to Taiwan. Uh, certainly, you know, that will have uh, serious implications, both economic and political, for India. But that's what I abstract from, uh, uh, if, if that is uh, uh, done. Uh, then this is the rough trajectory, I expect, and, and that is the restoration of the old normal. Now, why such growth is possible? First of all, uh, India really has political stability. Uh, and, and it is a democratic quality which imparts this kind of uh, stability to both politics as well as the economic reforms that have been put in place. So the, uh, over the, 20, oh, the 30 years period now, you know, it, uh, as you can see that whereas China could change its economic policies very rapidly, right? Once Deng Xiaoping came along, decided that he wanted to change the course, he could change course relatively rapidly. He also had domestic kind of opposition he had to uh, overcome, but it was easier for him to do so uh, than it was for the Indian political leadership given its very contentious internal democracy. But at the same time, while that change was slow, there is greater possibility of the change being sustained. As uh, you know, in the authoritarian system, if the leader takes a t turn for the worse, then that change for the worse can also happen rapidly, as we are currently witnessing. Uh, 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 President Xi has decided to move in, in a different direction, uh, and, and, and that change in the direction has also impacted the economic policies 
that uh, he is now uh, pursuing. Uh, and, and, and India, in this sense, I think, because of the very stable uh, 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 democratic tradition which it has set up, for, uh, which it has established over the last 75 years, has better chance of sustaining the current economic policies and the direction, I would say, that the, direction, that the economic reforms, though they will continue to perhaps be slow, they will continue uh, as, as, as they have. Uh, and, and, and you know, progressively India has uh, successfully implemented reforms that were initially far more contentious. Uh, GST reform, very difficult one, I, you know, took almost 15 years to finally bring to fruition. Uh, the bankruptcy code, I had been writing for at least 20 years that India needed a state of art, uh, uh, US style kind of bankruptcy law. Finally, that is also in place. Um, similarly, labor laws, which uh, Vajpayee government had actually tried to, uh, to, uh, to implement but was, success, was unsuccessful, have now been uh, 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 enacted by the parliament. They still have to be implemented uh, 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 because the rules, of regulation, rules and regulations have not been written, so they have not been implemented, but this will happen soon after uh, uh, the, uh, the forthcoming elections. So some of the very difficult reforms have uh, 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 been implemented, and, and that process, I think, will continue. So that is one part of the advantage. Second, there is a wide scope for catch-up. Uh, so India's per capita income is still relatively low, 2,500. Even China, uh, uh, with which we next compare, has per capita income in the range of 13 to $15,000, uh, so almost like four times of India's. Um, if you go to Korea, that's $30,000 plus, United States, $50,000 plus. So the scope, you know, and, and what this reflects is that per capita output, given the current day technology of that magnitude is possible. But in India, we are still at 2,500. So what is lacking is not enough capital. Uh, uh, so the Indian workers are working with far smaller volumes of capital, uh, uh, which also means that the technology that Indian labor force is working with is a very different technology, uh, but all this, as capital accumulation happens, as more and more modern technology is adopted, uh, clearly the output in India can rise. So even there is no new innovation required, even with the existing technology, this is feasible, and this is what we call the catch up, and, and so that uh, uh, provides the scope for continued growth for quite a long time at high rates. Demography, I think, is India's very big advantage. There are two major aspects of that demography. One is the size, and the other is the composition. Size helps. India is a large economy, and that helps in many different ways. Uh, uh, in one, one way it helps is that it generates economies of scale in things like whatever is the public goods, you know. Uh, uh, the, 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 in, in the provision of the public goods, uh, larger the population, Population, they lower the per unit cost of supply of that good. A good example is the digital infrastructure. That once you have built the digital infrastructure to add more, to allow more and more uh, uh, users, uh, the average cost actually doesn't rise much. There's hardly any marginal cost to it, so average cost actually declines as more and more use. But even on the user side, you know, the more users there are, the more useful, more productive that platform becomes for the existing users. So there is this scale economy that arises, similar, the, the same one also in the provision of infrastructure and whatnot. So that's one part of the size. The other is, of course, that you know, when you've got large country, both in terms of geographical area as well as in terms of the population or workforce, uh, then you can create the supply chains within the same country. And that is a huge advantage because you know when supply chains have to be spread out in, uh, let's say, a dozen different countries, uh, every time uh, uh, some component crosses the border, there is friction at the border. And if you are crossing, you know, 20 times, uh, uh, if a product, uh, the, the, the supply chain is really spread out into a dozen or 20 countries. Uh, uh, th these components are going to cross many, many different borders, and each border crossing requires friction. But if the supply chains are in the same country, uh, that, of course, means far less friction, uh, and, and, and uh, in turn, 
uh, cost efficiency. So that also is an advantage that the large size confers on, on the country. And then there is the composition of the workforce, which is also working for India, because currently the, this, this workforce is relatively younger. So the dependency ratio is, 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 uh, is, is significantly lower than in the United States, Europe, nor even in China. Uh, 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 what that translates into is a couple of things. One, uh, uh, to the extent that in young age we all save, and in old age we you know, draw upon our accumulated wealth uh, from the young age. Uh, what that means is that the savings, if, if the proportion of population uh, uh, of the younger, if, if the share of the younger population is large in the total population, then uh, in effect your savings rate will be higher, and that we are beginning to see. This has been going on, going process actually, and, and the savings rate uh, uh, already is well above 30 percent in India, uh, and, and that is what is reflecting, uh, reflected in the high uh, investment rate of 34 percent that, that uh, we talked about in the morning today. Um, also, a younger population brings greater energy, uh, and it also brings greater innovation. Uh, so uh, once again, that uh, is an advantage. Um, China is its, in its slowing down phase, and that is reinforced by international political and economic uncertainty. And that, of course, geopolitically provides an advantage uh, uh, for India. This is something the previous session uh, had discussed. My view, I think you know, the previous session perhaps downplayed that uh, this advantage because it still has not, uh, you know, if you look at the data, it is correct. It, 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 it is correct that if you take this picture as it stands today, that advantage has not translated in a major way. But I personally think that this advantage is over the next 10 to 20 years is going to get incredibly magnified. Uh, also because of the, some of the policy changes that India, that are underway in India, there's a great uh, uh, enthusiasm now finally to at least open up trade through free trade agreements. Uh, uh, it would be good if we actually can build up the consensus to free up, uh, uh, to bring down uh, the, the, the tariffs down across the board. But if not that, at least, you know, in terms of free trade agreements, several have been signed, uh, you know, Australia, after that the UAE, then EFTA, the European free trade area uh, uh, countries. So they're signed. The one with the UK is, I understand, almost done. So it should happen within uh, a few months of the, after the elections. And then the European Union. Uh, and if I go by the ambition that the leadership expresses, uh, perhaps some sort of arrangement with the United States as well. Free trade agreement with the United States is going to be an uphill thing, but some sort of uh, uh, reciprocal trade agreement uh, certainly can happen. So, uh, and, and there is consensus for many of the other reforms, privatization. Uh, one challenge will be the land markets, which we talked uh, br briefly about. You know, that is where the states have to come into play and all. But these are the reasons, I think, why uh, a future, to me, looks good. Very briefly and very quickly, since I have perhaps take, gone a little bit over my time, uh, uh, just uh, what is India's big challenge? To me, you know, the big challenge of India ultimately deep down is one of uh, generally small economic units. Whether you look at the, uh, you know, rural urbanization issue on which I want to spend just one minute of time in, in a second, but uh, uh, if you look the the, the size of the farms in India, uh, almost half of the farms you, you'll see are, uh, you know, 48 percent. This is 2015 figures, and now probably it's, it's more than 48 uh, percent. Th the, these are less than half hectare. Average uh, uh, the size of those units is just uh, a quarter hectare. Um, very, very small farms. Likewise, the Indian enterprise, Indian firms actually uh, uh, tend to be very small as well. Um, uh, um, you, you know, about 45% of India's workforce is, are, is, is employed in enterprises that are less than 20 workers. And another 45% is in, the, uh, in, in agriculture. So, so the workforce is, in this sense is, is, is also small farms, small, very, very small enterprises. Uh, but above all, I, uh, uh, to, uh, I think the biggest challenge really is, is embedded in this particular table. What this table gives you is from 2011 census, 
takes out the proportion of the population uh, in rural India uh, by the size of the habitation. Uh, what I want to look you at is the last two of these columns and uh, the fourth line, fourth row with the numbers. Uh, what you would see is that you know about 76.5 percent of the uh, rural population which is also 52.6% of the total Indian population is in habitations that are smaller than 5,000. Now these are very small habitations. Uh, you can bring rural roads to them, you can bring electricity to them, you can bring water to them, you can bring toilets to them, uh, 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 you can bring food to them, but what after that? I think that is where the issue comes in that you know, if one is really looking at sustained, significant prosperity, uh, 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 you, you cannot do through redistribution that you bring, need to bring in good jobs to, to, to that population. But the industry is not going to go into those small habitations. And this is where the urbanization is incredibly important. I think that is not received its deserved share uh, of attention, in my view, in, in the last 20 years or 30 years of reforms. That, I think, has to be the next really big frontier. And this whole issue of small enterprises, small farms, it is all connected, in my thinking, to urbanization, that if workforce begins to move uh, out of agriculture into industry and services, into urban agglomerations, that is going to reduce uh, the burden not on land in the rural areas, so that land uh, those land holdings will begin to get larger as well. Uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, industry scale uh, is connected to urbanization because larger enterprises tend to be urban enterprises. Uh, uh, typically, rural enterprises are very, very small enterprises. Uh, so either this has to happen by cities growing bigger, or it has to happen by some of the rural agglomerations turning urban, which can happen, by the way, Shenzhen in China in 1980 used to be a bunch of fishing villages with a population of only 300,000. Today it's about more like 13 million population and one of the most urbanized spots on the face of earth. So rural can also turn urban, but you know, either way urbanization through either the growth of the existing cities or through uh, uh, rural uh, 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 agglomerations turning urban has to happen. I think that really is the big challenge. Uh, and India really consciously needs to uh, uh, emphasize the scale a bit. You know, now some of the things India, which it never did on scale, is doing infrastructure in a variety of ways. You know, is being built on scale. Um, uh, uh, some of the social programs have been done on scale. You know, if you look at the, num the, the, the speed at which the bank accounts were proliferated, speed at which the uh, as, uh, uh, mobile phones spread, speed at which the toilets got built, speed at which the rural housing has been built. Uh, so scaling up process, at least in the public sector, has begun to take hold, but this has to happen in the private sector also. So I think that is really the big, uh, major frontier, uh, but if we can really overcome some of these obstacles, I do think that we will, uh, uh, when India is 125 years, uh, re have restored the old normal. Thank you. I invite you, Dr. Ray. Thank you for your thought-provoking remarks, uh, Professor. Hey, uh, um, well, let me start by thanking uh, Dr. Panagari for extending this invitation to me, and uh, it's been a pleasure here. Also, uh, Laura made it worthwhile, even independent for independent reasons. So uh, anyway, it's great to be here. And uh, uh, let me just start by saying I really enjoyed, I enjoyed the entire uh, day, but uh, this paper was a pleasure to read, because um, uh, so I learned a few things as well as uh, just going through it. Um, so uh, India clearly appears to be at an inflection point today. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's possible for it to take off uh, on an accelerated development path, which I would think is the collective wish of this room. This is where we should go. Uh, however, it's important for the country to get its policy orientation right. Uh, 
And so, uh, and so in that sense, the paper is very timely because it flags some key issues going forward. So um, let me just say that the paper has two parts. Uh, part one is the old normal part, uh, which is, it's, I'm guessing that is what attracted a lot of people and that's what you were uh, focusing on as well. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting exercise. It's focusing on the timelines for India's catch up to China and the US. Um, this part is somewhat speculative, uh, and so um, that's not in essentially my, I mean, and plus uh, uh, Dr. Conigari has spent a fair bit of time on it. So um, given that that's speculating is not potentially my comparative advantage. So I, I'm going to uh, focus more on part two of the paper. So I'm not going to sort of uh, deal with uh, when we might catch up with China or India. Uh, so the part two, I think the, the paper is, uh, and he also spent less time on it, so I think it's probably worthwhile focusing on it. Because he focused on some key challenges. That's what the part, uh, second part of the paper does. And the main, main theme of that second part is in this theme of smallness. Economic units are small across, uh, uh, and it seems, as I said, as he said, it seems to pervade many parts of the economy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on that part, uh, on the second part about these challenges, and what might they uh, uh, you know, imply and how might we deal with it. Um, so the fact that India's you know, economic units are small is across the board. Our farms are small, our towns and villages are small, our educational institutions are small, our establishments and firms are small. Um, so the paper really provides a very detailed and careful accounting of this generic smallness in the economy. I mean, the economy that all these units, and it takes a, a fair bit of work to kind of put it all together in some sort of uh, context about you know, quantifying the smallness and uh, uh, and so the paper does a really good job of doing that, and so that's I thought was a, was was uh, was fun to read. Um, so then, when you take that smallness, and then you say, okay, what does it mean for us? So the primary argument is, uh, and and this is not just true of this paper, but I think there's a gen gener general uh, perspective on in development that small economic units tend to constrain growth, tend to you know they tend to constrain development. Um, so small displaced habitations can really make delivery of public services a real challenge across the, you know, it's just, uh, uh, you're trying to deliver across a large, large big geographic uh, country to very small, into, just, it becomes a huge challenge to do that. Um, small farms, they tend to reduce efficiency and the productivity of farming. Uh, if you have small enterprises, they tend to reduce the productivity and there's a lot of evidence in manufacturing and I'll, I'll dive into that in just a bit. Small educational institutions. There's also, you know, this this uh, uh, notion that it tends to reduce the efficiency of schooling if you have incredibly small units and you're trying to. So, in other words, at the back of it, there are some fixed costs of uh, delivering a bunch of things, and if you're trying to defray the fixed costs of a very small numbers of people, you're going to create uh, uh, some uh, diseconomies. You're not really getting the economies of scale. Um, so, I'll get into all of that. I'll just start by flagging a little wrinkle here, which is that. There is this prevailing view that I just articulated that size induces productivity growth and development, that the causation ride, you know, in some sense it, it sort of uh, generates these scale economies. There is an alternative view which, all, which says the opposite, that it's development that induces agglomeration and bigger size distributions. Um, so in fact, I'm just, you know, uh, and this view is well articulated in a recent paper by Pashki. I mean, so the idea is that entrepreneurial productivity growth will itself induce bigger firm size and rising size dispersion across the economy. Um, and this and actually shows a fair bit of evidence uh, about that. So this, uh, you know, which way does the causation lie? I mean, I guess in, in, when we were growing up, we would call it the chicken and the egg. In economics, we call it endogeneity problems. But I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a more general issue about trying to figure out which direction is the causality going. Um, but the debate is a bit like asking does productivity growth reduce the agricultural share of output when an economy's dependence of agriculture shrinks? Is it due to productivity growth? Or does a higher agricultural share reduce productivity growth? I mean, they seem almost like I'm talking about the same thing. But, uh, you know, the profession has, I mean, development economists have a very strong view about this, which is, says that they go with the first one. It's the productivity growth that induces structural transformation, which releases people from agriculture and they move into other sectors. So, that causation going the other way. There is a long history of that. So 
Uh, there is this wrinkle about which direction does the causality go, but I'll leave that aside. I mean, this is a, this is a tough issue to deal with, so I'm not going to uh, touch it. I just wanted to flag it. Um, so, you know, all these pieces about, uh, you know, size and productivity of farms. So what is the evidence? Again, this whole thing about small fragmented farms, does it, how much of a, how much of a cost does that entail? So there's actually a lot of work on this, uh, on both on a cross-country basis and within country. Unfortunately, the findings are somewhat contradictory. So on the cross-country evidence tells us overwhelmingly that size of farms and productivity are very strongly po positively correlated. So, you know, uh, la large, you know, countries with bigger farm sizes have, you know, are much more productive. Countries with smaller farm, average farm size are much less productive. But then there is another whole set of studies that actually looks at it within countries and starts comparing you know, productivity across farm sizes within a country. And there they often find that size and productivity are negatively correlated. So, uh, so this creates a, some, somewhat of an issue that uh, how do I reconcile these two things? That cross-country studies is saying, telling me one thing about size and productivity relationships, the within country is saying something else. I think the issue is that the within country studies are often comparing small farms with slightly less small farms, or sli you know, so whereas the cross country studies are really comparing countries where the average size is very small with the countries where the average size is very large, and that's where you can identify these big differences. Um, so the gains are probably, you know, of getting larger farm sizes. The gains probably go from going from very small to very large, not from one to two hectares. I mean, that's not going to be where the gains are. The gains are probably if you really go into, into bigger, bigger holdings and then you get sort of uh, 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 much bigger productivity gains. Similarly, on this issue of size and productivity of schools, there's again, uh, you know, uh, education, uh, you know, there's been a fair bit of work on, uh, you know, there's some work on this that I could dig up, which is on, so the work on schooling, on human capital, et cetera, has focused uh, on three aspects. What is the optimal class size? What's the optimal school size? And then what's the optimal school district? Now, the school district issue is more a Western idea about how do I aggregate different schools into a certain district. But what is the optimal size of a, of a class? I mean, uh, for those of you who are trying to put your kids into, you know, uh, uh, into college. I mean, I know Praveen is somewhere here, but uh, he's desperately trying to figure out where should KI go. And so all of that is dictated on does, you know, Wharton has bigger class sizes, or does Columbia have bigger class sizes. So that's all about, uh, you know, about the class size. And, and does that, what kind, of, what kind of size would you like your kid to be in? Where does the learning becomes more, uh, where does it become more uh, better in some sense? Um, so actually, there is a fair bit of evidence that small size is better, you know, class sizes are better for learning, in particular for low-income kids. If they're in a smaller class, you learn better. Uh, that's the sangris levy study. Uh, school size, uh, you know, they, they find evidence of scale economy, that the larger size school somehow is able to deliver education at lower cost per child. And that's the, that's the scale economy, which is what um, rings kind of true. Now, recent work on this has kind of dug a little further and started uncovering the fact that there is actually a U-shaped relation. That, you know, the, uh, you know, there is this, initially there's a, you know, some big gains to having small sizes, and then uh, those gains disappear, but then uh, at some point the gains uh, start disappearing if you get too high. So that's this U-shaped relationship. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the caveat in all of this is that, you know, it seems though that super small sky uh, schools are not optimal. I mean, that's just, you're, you're, you know, it's just too expensive to have too small uh, a school size for, you know, you, you have this fixed cost of running schools, so you just need them to be a, a minimum scale in order to be able to uh, 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 in minimize the cost of educating your children. So if you have super so small schools, which the paper actually talks about, uh, the fact that there are in school sizes in India are often too small, and so we probably do need some consolidation there. A caveat is most of the stuff I could find was actually very US-centric, and, and, uh, and so I haven't seen a whole lot of work on this uh, in developing countries about the, what the optimal size is, but I, I'm sure Karthik Murlidhar and his, uh, and, his, and his cohorts are like, you know, probably have, have some project going on this, but we'll probably learn more about it. I'm going to spend the balance of my time talking about this last bit, which is establishment size and productivity, which is like a big thing, and we talk about this all the time, uh, that our Indian firm's too small or Indian establishments and factories, are they too small? 
So the key question, of course, when you ask something like this is what determines firm size? How does an establishment or a firm decide at what scale it should operate? Intuitively, if you're more productive, you should be larger, you should hire more people. And if you're less productive, your profits are low, you should be not employing that many people. I mean, so there should be a relationship between productivity and size. And that's sort of the uh, prevailing idea behind when we write down, uh, imagine what should determine the optimal size distribution of firms. We think that there should be a relationship with the productivity of firms, as we mentioned them. Uh, you know, so efficient economies should in actually induce this kind of pattern. So there has been a fair bit of work on this. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of talk about two uh, to start with. So there's one you know, a paper which really looks at US, Western Europe, and Eastern Europe. This is a paper, Bartelsmann uh, et al., uh, Holtewanger and company. So they looked at the covariance of size and productivity of firms. Um, and they looked at how that covariance looked for different sets of countries. And they found that the strength of this covariance was the highest in the US. It's a little lower in Western Europe, and it's much lower in Eastern Europe. And so they kind of made the statement that there is, they see this as a sign that resources are not best, you know, most efficiently allocated in less developed parts of the world than in more developed parts of the world, and which is the reason why this relationship between size and productivity tends to kind of get a bit more scrambled as you get uh, into uh, you know, poorer and poorer economies or less developed economies, so to speak. They call this resource misallocation, that resources are not going towards the most efficient units. They are somehow you know, going towards the less efficient guys. And that's why this you know, relationship looks a bit scrambled. There's more work actually on in India and in emerging economies. That's Shay Klino, are these two authors who've done a lot of work on this. And they've compared China, India, Mexico, and the US. And what they find is that uh, developing countries typically tend to have establishments that grow more slowly with age. They are smaller on average. They tend to use suboptimal input mixes. And they have lower productivity. That's the, you know, so when you, uh, and in fact, they quantify. They quantify, uh, they say, they, they call these misallocations, the fact that these resources aren't best allocated. And they say this misallocation can account for about 40% of the productivity gap of China and India with, 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 with the US, the fact that resources are not uh, uh, all allocated as first best principles would say. So that suggests that something's scrambling it. So the question, of course, that this doesn't answer is, why are firms too small? What is the source of the misallocation? Okay. Why, are, why, why does the firm size distribution not reflect productivity in the way that efficient economies should have? So what is the major constraint? And so that's the question that I want to sort of spend my last uh, you know, four or five minutes on. Um, so the typical focus when we are thinking about reasons why, uh, you know, why firms might be making suboptimal decisions or might be making decisions that are not exactly uh, uh, reflecting what their true efficiency is, oftentimes the focus goes on tax policies. Maybe it's tax policies that cause uh, or enforcement that, that reduces the incentive for a firm to grow beyond certain size. You want to stay below 20 or you want to stay below 50 because otherwise you get into uh, a different regulatory environment. It could be that, 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 that constrains firm growth because you're trying to avoid. Uh, um, sometimes you worry about land acquisition policies. That might prevent, uh, prevent growth as well. Uh, but there is an, another possibility, which is the absence of market discipline, in the sense that are you forced to confront market realities on a day-to-day -day basis, or do you have some sort of a sheltered market within which you can operate? And that can change the incentives to grow, depending on you know, wh why you grow and why you don't grow would be crucially a function of whether or not you're facing some market realities or you're not. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is, uh, this is some recent work I'm doing with uh, 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 Sudipta Ghosh and, and Swapnika Ratapalli uh, using the ASI data. So this is the distribution of uh, productivities of Indian firms by different size classes in terms of employment. So the first bar on the left are firms that are, you know, employed fewer than 20 people, and then it's 20 to 50, et cetera, and the vertical axis is plotting the average TFP of each of those firms, of these firms in these. Uh... So what you clearly see over here is the Indian firms, the average TSP has, TFP has this uh, very strange uh, U-shaped uh, uh, relationship that 
productivity of some of these very low uh, employing firms is actually very high. And then in the middle, productivity is quite low. And then it starts looking pretty good. I mean, it's like as you go further and further to the right, bigger size firms are more productive. That's exactly what you would hope that the entire economy should show, that as you get more productive, you, you grow, you have more, more people. So to bring it back to this issue of market discipline, I, I kind of uh, broke it down, this, this set of establishments that I have in the data, into those who rely on exports intensively and those who don't. So exporting firms and non-exporting firms. And I'm defining exporting firms as those with exports to sale ra sales ratios that are greater than at least 20%. OK, so now I'm going to plot that same picture but broken down into exporters and non-exporters. So the left panel are non-exporting firms, the same size class and productivity map. And the right panel are exporting firms and the same uh, size, pro size class by productivity. So if you look at the right panel, this is precisely what any healthy economy's firms should look like. That you know, as you get bigger, you're more productive. So it seems like there's a mapping from, uh, between size and productivity in a very clear way. You look at those guys on the left, something seriously messed up amongst these, and that's the majority of Indian firms. That's, that's the establishments, that's where about 80, 90% of these guys are. Now you ask, why is this person, this, this firm, establishment that has more than 1,000 people, how come it has grown despite its productivity being way below anything within the other non-exporters? Also, you know, forget about comparing with I mean, if you look across these two pictures, the scales are the same. So almost uh, size class by size class, exporters are more productive than non-exporters. So whether, except for the below 20 group, which is almost the same, but every other group, it's exporters are more productive. But then when you compare across these size classes, the non-exporters are bizarre. I mean, these guys are growing for reasons that are unrelated to productivity. They are growing for, uh, uh, you know, and so this same thing shows up. This is a slightly more formal way of trying to control for you. These are bin scatter plots. That's what these are called. So these are controlling for different establishments belong to different industries. So this is controlling for that. And once again, the blue dots are the uh, productivity uh, size relationship for non-exporters. And the red dots are the productivity size relationship for the exporters. And you can see the correlation is strongly positive for exporters. And the correlation is strongly negative for non-exporters. This, to me, is sort of capturing a huge part of the issue that, that we have about what sorts of policies do we, so this came up a little earlier you know, in, the, in the previous session, that um, why is it that these non-exporters are growing? You might think, could be it, it could be it's rent seeking that is the reason for growth, that you, know, you are not exposed to foreign competition, you're not exposed to, you're not trying to export, and, it's also important to remember that exports and imports, these are, these are flip sides of the same coin. You can't have, there's something called the learner symmetry theorem that, that you know, if you, whether you impose uh, import tariffs or you impose import, export taxes, they have you know, pretty much the same outcome. So uh, the fact that non-exporters can survive and grow despite having almost uh, no productivity fundamentals to back you up suggesting that there are distortions in the system that allows them to grow without needing any fundamental reason to grow. What could that be? It could be rent seeking. It could be subsid subsidies that are being received for different, you know, for, you know, you lobby and you get stuff. But this is something that we need to focus on much harder. One simple solution, of course, is to encourage exports and limit, and limit uh, domestic market uh, protection. Because the more you limit domestic market protection, the more you're going to get those kinds of non-exporting firms whose size growth will be completely unrelated to their efficiency and productivity level. And I think that is where uh, the challenge is. And I'll leave you with, I mean, you know, I think, I think uh, th this has been a major uh, issue about, uh, about size and how it, it impacts India's exports, India's productivity. And the size has often been a major constraint. And so size is small, clearly it could be for policy reasons, it could be because of uh, uh, you know, implicit market protection which is giving them. But I'll also leave you with one small anecdote which, uh, uh, and I'll summarize my story behind the anecdote. So the anecdote is uh, this friend of mine, uh, she, she runs, a, she heads up a, 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 
a product sourcing company. Uh, you know, they source products for you know uh, for foreign foreign buyers. So essentially, they aggregate orders from J.C. Penney. From uh, so if they you know so this particular story I'm about to tell you is around Christmas time. Uh, there are all these sales that go on all over North America, and then some product. These things are all ordered back in August or September. Yeah, and then some things hit, some things don't. And so you all said J.C. Penney, and there were Christmas tree hangings that suddenly became very popular. They flew off the shelf and they run out. So then what they did was they sort of sent an emergency thing that we need more supplies of this stuff. This is what we need. So these things are sourced from the cheapest uh, uh, provider anywhere in the world. So most of them happen to be in Asia, we talked about. So uh, it goes out to China. There are aggregators, these order aggregators in China, in, in Taiwan, in in Vietnam, in India, they're, you know, they're everywhere. So this friend of mine was the Indian uh, uh, heading up. The, so she gets this fax saying we need, or the email saying we need this. So she sends out to her suppliers, which are, you know, small towns, small suppliers. These are, uh, so can you give me a coat? This is what we want. And she's waiting uh, for two days and then finally writes back to the main proprietor, there's no coat yet. And so the guy says, in Hindi, it's much more colorful, but I'll say it in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, in English. But uh, so they say, you know, it's Sharmaji who does this, and he's gone on a pilgrimage to Vaishno Devi. He'll be back on Tuesday. I'll send it to you on Tuesday. This is Wednesday. So this to him, the proprietor, is perfectly OK. So she says, by this time, uh, you know, these people have already received all these quotes from, from the tai Taiwanese people, from the Vietnamese people, from, so what chance do we have? We're just sitting around waiting, twiddling our thumbs for this gentleman to come back from Vaishno Devi. Now, uh, it almost seems like when the person said it, it's a completely valid reason. That's how they perceive it, that he's gone to Vaishno Devi, what can we do? I mean, you know, this is how it is. Uh, now, that is a rather, it's, it's saying two things. It's saying the scale of the firm is so small, there are no redundancies built in. There is nobody who can back up anyone. And that's a, that's, a, that's a function of scale. You're operating at such a small scale that you cannot cover. It's like a soccer team where the right back slips and nobody covers the guy. I mean, you know, the opposition just goes straight through. So that's, that's one problem with scale, having too small a scale. The other one, you know, I don't know how you deal with that, it also reflects a lack of ambition, some deeper level that there is a satisfied, people are just satisfied being, you know, it's okay, it's a, it's, it's a fine life, why do I have to kill myself to do it? I don't know how you break that. That, that seems a much harder hurdle. So I'll just leave you guys to, to think about that. Thank you, Dr. Larry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've got an amazing um, insight from all sides, and one side of where India can grow and how it should grow, and where it will reach in uh, less than 50 years. And on the other side, you've got uh, uh, Dr. Leary talking about the wrinkles, about what the, uh, the problems can be, and also raising some very interesting insights on scale and productivity in relation to what Dr. Panagriya said, that India always has small scale and in order for it to grow, it must grow faster in terms of getting larger scale. So uh, I think the jury is out on that about small scale and large scale, according to what Dr. Larry has said. Um, let me ask, uh, before I open it up to the audience, uh, Dr. Panagan and, and to Dr. Larry. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, a lot about economic growth, lots of figures. Uh, being a journalist, let me introduce politics into it, right? <laughs> Because everything is politics, and politics is everything. So we look at um, India in terms of you know the, the growth tra trajectory, etc. But India is not China. It's it's so diverse. It's got a messy politics. You're seeing it today in the general election, right? Uh, it's an epidemic of populism. Uh, freebies being given out. Uh, everybody's kind of racing to the bottom. How do you account for that in all your projections? In terms of, you know, the, and one part is also the cultural part. You know, Sharmaji has gone to Vaishna Devi. Okay, <laughs> doesn't matter, right? Uh, lack of ambition. So how do you inject that into your projections for India? Is the fact of 
the politics, uh, also the fact of reform. We talked about reform. Look at the way the, uh, the farm sector reform got stalled, which I thought the farm laws which were, project were proposed were very good laws, which would you know increase scale, increase productivity, uh, give better income to farmers. But they got stalled. Uh, labor market reforms, you've talked about uh, demographics and how India's demographics are great, but that's also a, a burden because where are the jobs going to come from to take care of all these young people who are coming out? And you know the unemployment figures for, you know, from people who are coming in from 18 to 24 is huge in India. Um, it's a time bomb sitting there. So can you address some of these? Uh, I've asked quite a few questions within the questions, but you get the general trend. So, you know, by nature, I'm an optimist. And so I look at the glass, half glass full, rather than half glass empty. Um, I used to be pessimistic along the lines that you have just mentioned, uh, till the 1980s. Um, my pessimism basically was grounded in the fact that, you know, we got uh, a political class and a bureaucracy especially, uh, which is so entrenched uh, and, and has such vested interest in the license permit raj and all the restrictions that we had, that we will never change. Things cannot get better in India. But then 1991 happened. Then one time I remember, you know, after 1991 reforms, uh, uh, on, on a trip, uh, on, on a bus from Delhi to Jaipur, because heavy rains had broken all the roads and all, uh, a four-hour trip became an eight-hour trip. I said, all right, reforms we can do, but roads have to be built by the government, and our government is completely incapable. Then came along Atal Bihari Vajpayee, and that, you know, quadrilateral highway, and when I sort of got onto this, going from Jaipur to Bhilwada on the stretch up to Kishangar, which was six lanes, and I got to it, and I said, wow, this is America. So, uh, things that I did not think would happen did happen in India, and, and that is what drives my optimism. And a lot of the difficult reforms, I said this that, you know, uh, 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 we can't move at the pace that an authoritarian government can move, but we move. And consensus has been evolved, and so many reforms that looked so difficult actually at one point have happened. Even labor laws have been enacted. In fact, if you look at this, the, the, the much of the struggle on reforms has been more at the political level, not so much at the people level. I have seen hardly any pushback except in the case of the farm laws, which had a very special case. Uh, 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 but otherwise, when you say that, oh, there is no consensus on reforms, we used to hear this actually during uh, uh, 10 years of UPA government, but people were never in the, in, in the way. I think the consensus was lacking within the government. And then, you know, you've had the change of the government, and under Modi government, the reforms have come back. So. That is my kind of uh, uh, view, and, and now we have broken the barrier. Anyway, now it, it's not an issue of whether we are going to reform or not. It's just a matter of, you know, when is it going to happen, when, it, when you've got the right window to do it. Um, so a lot more consensus on reforms. A lot of the things that I didn't think would happen have happened. So I think we, we will we'll certainly get there. A uh, couple of things that uh, Amartya said, you know, Whatever you do with the size and, 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 and all, at the end of the day, India's firms are such small firms, farms, schools. You know, when your schools are less than 20 students in the entire school on, on averaging uh, 11 or 12 students per class, I know that this is suboptimal. This is not all. Even pedagogically, that class is not going to get anywhere, you know, because per class you've got five students, six students. So, so that is what we are talking about. On your firm uh, uh, analysis you did, by the way, missing very badly because you are using the ASI data, but you're missing the huge number of millions of firms actually which are not ASI. They're not in the ASI, they're the really small ones. Are, uh, are these what we call the uh, pr uh, proprietorship and uh, uh, partnership uh, which, which appear in the informal uh, uh, survey of the informal uh, sector. 
I mean, there are none every five years or something. So there actually your productivity, I don't know what the relationship will be, but this is all very, very low productivity firms. So if you put those together with yours, you'll see a massive difference between the larger firms and the smaller firms. So, so I think, uh, no, no, I'm just saying that the, then the larger firms will actually give you by comparison because because the weight of these very, uh, these very low productivity small firms in your sample of small firms would actually rise dramatically once you combine those two. Uh, 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 so, 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 so that is that is my point. Also, there, by the way, uh, uh, a lot of these firms are probably coming from in these very protectionist sectors. So one has to also separate them by the sector. You know, the, in, in an export sector where you are not being protected by the tariffs, you, you'll probably see a more robust pattern. In when you are protected then efficient and inefficient, they all get into the game. Uh, and, and, so, and, and that's, that's what may be coming in your ASI, yeah, ASI data, ASI data, yeah. So, so do you want to comment on it? Um, I'll just say uh, one thing about, uh, you know, when you look at US states, or you look at Canadian provinces, or you look at Japanese prefectures, what you see is over time, there is this narrowing of gaps between the different uh, provinces, the different states. If you plot Indian states, uh, this is a very tepid. In fact, it was almost like you know there was no relationship between uh, growth and initial levels early on. Things have improved a little bit. So why do I bring that up? I think. I worry a little bit that we don't take sufficient advantage of our federal structure. That, uh, you know, we have traditionally, I think, ended up relying too much on the center to kind of, uh, you know, do, uh, do and now I know you're, 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 you're heading this up and we have uh, uh, Mr. N.K. Singh here who's also, you know, presided over this in the past. Um, but there is an issue about uh, introducing Encouraging competition across states, and one way to do that is fiscal federalism in a in a more enhanced way. So, uh, I thought it was you know this whole thing about has 42 percent gone too high or not has to be read also with that kind of context. That uh, are we getting the states to compete with each other in terms of best practices and so on, and that demonstration effect and the fact that you could lose business if you're not. But it's too easy right now to complain that the center is squeezing stuff, and, and I'm not getting this. So some of it may be valid, some may be completely you know, just political posturing. But, but it's important, I think, that you take that option away for, you know, it's too easy a way for uh, misfunctioning state governments to hide behind that uh, uh, the, the central government kind of you know, messed us up. Uh, so, and that I think a little bit of this fiscal federalism should take that on board about getting states to compete with each other more than they are. Professor um, Panagra, you mentioned the bureaucracy. Right? Um, in my view, the bureaucracy is still in its colonial mindset. It is a mindset of control, regulate, rather than to facilitate. Right? Um, we have, what, 53 or 54 ministries. I think the US is run by 12 or 14 departments. right? Um, there's been no reform of the Indian bureaucracy, right? We've done what Dr. Manmohan Singh did was what I would say was homeopathy, right? What India needs is surgery in terms of the bureaucracy. Um, do you think the bureaucracy is a r obstacle to, to India's development uh, for growth? It, does, it, does it deliver the right amount of state capacity to deliver all the public goods which are required. There's been a great improvement. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. Great changes happen in India. But it's all stop, start, stop, start, right? Uh, so what is your view on the, the bureaucracy and state capacity to deliver public goods? Yeah, so this is a subject on which I've written for at least 20 years. My first article I did probably somewhere in 2002 or 2003, calling for lateral entry. Um, I think that, I mean, Given that changing the entire system is so difficult, I've always felt that lateral entry is one way to proceed. Uh, but even that has been extremely hard. Actually, you know, the current government has tried to introduce. By the way, in my Niti Ayo, I did introduce that reform, and it has stuck. 
one third of the staff is lateral in Niti Aayog today. <laughs> yes, but but you know, I I did where I could, uh, 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 but but this also is very difficult reform. Uh, just two points on this. One is that certainly within the bureaucracy, there are some incredibly good offices. And, and without their presence, none of the reforms could have happened. So one has to acknowledge that fact. You know, we have Mr. N.K. Singh sitting here, uh, and, and there are a few. Uh, so, so there's no question you know, there. But central tendency of the bureaucracy has been to be, a obstacle, be an obstacle to, to change. And, and that's, look, <laughs> the book, my, my next book that's going to come out in two or three months. It really makes the case that actually, you know, the, the, the socialist philosophy that we inculcated during the Nehru era really came to embrace the entire country. So whether you talk of the bureaucracy, you talk of the political class, whether you talk of the intellectuals, particularly the economists, even the businessmen, uh, the philosophy of socialism has continued through this inheritance you know, the, the, the previous, the, the new IS officers come in, they learn from the old ones. Yeah. New economists who uh, come in get taught by the old economists. Um, and in, in writing this book, I sort of asked myself the question that can I identify a handful of economists who were home taught, who didn't go abroad or were not, uh, didn't work abroad, who are truly committed economic reforms who were pro-market, right? let's not say reforms, who were pro-market. I could think of only one. Amazingly, you know. So, so virtually everybody that I could think, I could, every name, and there are not many names anyway, uh, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, there was some connection abroad. Either they studied abroad or worked abroad for several years. Uh, so this, this has really penetrated everywhere. And that is what makes the change far more difficult. Yeah. This is why people like us have to continue to push, push, push. And luckily, I think there has been a payoff to doing this push. And we'll continue to do that. You see, you also have, uh, I mean, you have today the, I don't know whether the Congress party has an ideology or not, but it's definitely looked at as center left. You know, that's why even your disinvestment program has gone on a slow track, which was going fast which is, I think, one of the necessities of India in terms of getting more efficient in terms of its large uh, sector companies, public sector companies, private, even public sector banks has been slowed down. There is this uh, feeling, this socialist uh, mindset is still there, meaning um, I think even Manmohan Singh was a closet socialist, right? He, was, uh, he couldn't do the, the reforms uh, fully. Uh, so I think how, I don't totally agree with it. India has totally embraced the market economy right now. It's, it's still going in fits and starts. There's an ideological problem there. We cannot embrace it fully. Um, would you agree with that? That it's, you know, you said in your presentation that we are now market economy is there. I don't believe this because there's, there's this resistance there to going fully market economy and open. And even in our foreign trade, we are protectionist in our mindset. We can't open up. Okay, so that, that's that's the glass half empty. Yeah. And 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 there is a glass half full, <laughs> uh, at which I look. You know, which was completely empty actually in 1980s. Uh, so you know, things that have gone away. Yeah. Li entire true. license permit Raj. Yeah, we true. used to have imports. Every product was was on an import license list on top. The average tariff was 150%. Average tariff was 150%. The top tariff rate went to 355%. So, a lot of progress. That's one part of it. But then there are also a lot of the other things that we have been able to do. You know, private entry has happened. Airlines used to be only Sarkari airline. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's telephone used to be yeah. only Sarkari telephone. Is this because you now have it? Yeah. You think that this was always there. But, you know, unfortunately, I'm old. Uh, so I, I can remember the days. Uh, things have really changed, uh, you know, quite dramatically they have changed. And which is why I'm very optimistic that I think all we need is keep pushing. Uh, but look at the GST, sir. 
the way it was implemented, I mean, the way it was finally structured, I would say. It's a great thing it happened. It should have happened. But the number of slabs which are there, the categories, is Kit Kat a biscuit or a chocolate, right? So it should go into 5%. Is it a chapati, a chapati, or a papad, or this thing, right? This is the bureaucratic mindset. They can't be audacious. This is the problem in India's you know, politics and, and the bureaucracy. See, see, you, you, you are getting impatient. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Have to wait to 2047. <laughs> this, this, is exactly, this is exactly what we did not do for four decades. There was nobody impatient. But look what we did. No, no, no. There was we, nobody what we ended up, we did GST, a good thing, but then we made it into a mess. No, it's not a mess. I mean, it's, it's a, okay. It, look, look, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not as, it, 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 it may look to you messy, but the big, big part of the reform, the really big reform with the payoff is the fact that on any given product, there's yeah, only a single more, tax. Yes. On any given product, so therefore for the given product, there is a single market India-wide. This is a huge reform. Agreed that multiple rates are not a great thing. Uh, and particularly, there's also some sort of inversion in some of the rates yeah. where the in inputs are taxed more heavily than, uh, than, than the final product and also. But that is the nature of the process in India. It, it will start messily, gradually will sort of clean up. And we'll also reverse occasionally, as we have done in the case of tariffs. Yeah. But, but I think that overall direction is absolutely in uh, 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 in, 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 on the side of liberalization. Now, you mentioned privatization, for example. It's not that the government has not tried. It's been happening, and several privatizations have happened, which we, you know, people don't report, so you don't see it. But uh, uh, Air India is not the only privatization that has happened. There are at least half dozen other uh, uh, units, but still, they are small, admittedly. Yeah. Part of the problem is that during those four decades, we put so many layers uh, over layers of regulation that privatization process itself is damn difficult. You know, one of the, you, you get the units privatized. Next day, the matter ends up in the Supreme Court. Somebody challenges something, so it, it waits again. Not to mention the fact that the whole process to begin with is so ridden with uh, layers of regulation. Yeah. So all this, is, the, the legacy has been so bad. But on the other hand, I think we are making good progress. <laughs> well, I'm okay. I won't argue. <laughs> 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 okay, I can. I'll open it up to the audience. I'll take. I prefer to take one question at a time because that gets all mixed up, and you can address it to any one of the panelists, right? So. Uh, I have a question for. Yeah. Can you get up? Yeah, so it's a very interesting paper based on the ASI factories that you have analyzed, and uh, external orientation or competition being one of the answers for productivity. But I don't think it answers the question of why you know firms are small or factories are small. So I think uh, you have answered a different question, which is equally important. Uh, but I don't know if it's, if it's a response to his question, uh, his uh, paper, isn't it? Yeah. No, I, We haven't still figured out why everything is small, as he put it in his paper, which, by the way, I entirely agree with. And I'd co one of the answers could be what they were discussing just now, which is the, 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 the controls are so massive when you become bigger that many firms prefer to stay below the radar. Yeah, no, I, I, so there are two aspects to it. As I said, there's why, are, yeah, why is the average size small? And then the question is, what is the dynamic for firm growth? Why, why do firms, some firms grow and some don't? And I guess what I was trying to suggest was that if you, you know, open up competitive pressures throughout the economy, you will start at least getting a mapping between the efficiency or productivity of firms and growth. And so you will have at least a more, uh, you know, well-founded growth dynamic as opposed to, uh, so you're absolutely right that it inherently by itself doesn't answer why they are small, but at least if you can fix that part that who is growing, you'll at least get the qualitative dynamics right. Yes. 
Uh, this is Sumit Ganguly, and I'm with an IT services company. Uh, an observation and then the question. The observation is the entire discussion, the bright spot out of India is almost $200 billion worth of IT services export. And we haven't talked about it. We've talked about diamond polishing and diamond export. Uh, so could that be an important substitution to the manufacturing that we're talking about? And I just came back from Las Vegas. Uh, I was at the Google Next conference. And this whole aspect of generative AI could be an existential crisis or a huge opportunity for the country. It could be a headwind for the middle income or the low income. Uh, McKinsey recently decided not to recruit a large portion of their new entrants. And it could be a huge democratization for countries. So one, the observation that we didn't hear anything about ID services and technology. And your comments on what could be done to propel it further. So Nobody would say that IT exports and IT industry is not important. Of course, it's extremely important. Um, and, and the export performance has been absolutely superlative as well. Having said that, uh, let me ask you, I've got you know, about, let's say, maybe 300 million farmers uh, in, in, in agricultural sector. How many of those can you employ there? That's a rhetorical question. That's a rhetorical question. Uh, because even the US IT industry, is, as far as I've checked the number, uh, employment-wise, like 5 million or 6 million. Uh, you've got a very large workforce to employ there. IT industry is not going to do it. Look, I wrote this first article on this whole issue. These are a lot of the people who are talking about their services, this, that, and the other. are new and haven't read, read anything that others wrote years ago. 2005, I wrote in the Wall Street Journal, because at that time, they were already talking about, oh, IT industry is the India's, and this is where we, could, we should go, and this is where the uh, 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 India's development uh, answer to the India's development problem is. So I'd written at that time that, look, you know, you've got to walk on two legs. Uh, IT industry is doing well, and that's great, but you cannot really walk or run uh, 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 to to to, to uh, uh, a state of prosperity without success in manufacturing, because at the end of the day, the transition requires this labor force uh, out of uh, to come out of in the, uh, agriculture, and they can't go into all these IT. Uh, they can't go into IT industry uh, unless you wait for another two or three generations uh, for for them to actually acquire the kinds of skills that are required by IT. So you do need to walk on two legs. You need manufacturing without, at least, I mean, I have in my mind zero doubt about that. Just to follow up on that, where do you think the new jobs will come from? Because a lot of times, I mean, people say the export ship has sailed and what China grew on. And we've seen our percentages are so low in so many presentations. Where are the new jobs going to come from for the Indian demographic dividend? Um, if, what kind of manufacturing? You're saying it has to be manufacturing, it has to be services, I believe, too. Uh, tourism, for example, India's dismal performance on tourism. 10 million tourists, including NRIs, coming in. I mean, it's, it's pathetic. And India's, you know, cultural diversity, the whole historic monuments, mountains, lakes, beaches, everything. We have miserable failure on that. So where is the new jobs going to come from? Yeah, so... I am an economist. I believe in good policies. I usually don't pick the se sectors, but you know, which sector the entrepreneurs will decide. Uh, you decided that media was uh, 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 had an opportunity. It had no regulation. <laughs> no, no. But so but, but this is why I'm saying the policies must right, be encouraged. Right, right. Precisely. This is why I'm saying that you know I I believe in good policies. Entrepreneurs will figure out where to go. But first, you've got to have the right policies in place. Having said that, certainly these jobs ultimately uh, a, a very important part of this uh, 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 job creation has to come from labor-intensive sectors, which is part is manufacturing. Construction is going to be can be potentially very big. Uh, it, it already is actually. Uh, 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 but 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 you've got to make the, uh, 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 the, 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 the regulation friendly enough for the labor-intensive sectors to, to arise. 
just so that you know, since we are talking about this, um, this question was also raised about why the firms are small, etc., in India. Uh, historically, I think a lot of this is in the history. When we started the development process, we said, Nehru said, that we'll put all the savings into these three steel mills. Look at the second five-year plan. What we did, this was a low level of GDP. The savings rate was only 7%. We put most of it in three steel mills during the five, this five years worth of, you know. One glaring statistic I'll give you, which was reported by uh, P.T. Bauer in his book in 1961, that the investment in uh, the expenditure on the development expenditure on primary education during the five-year plan, second five-year plan, was half of what we invested in one steel mill. Now, what we did was put capital in one place, which was steel mills, which was working with hardly any labor, and then we put all the workers into cottage, small household, these industries. So, this is where the consumer goods will be produced, and this is where the employment will be. But we refused to give them any capital. So on one extreme, you had labor with zero capital. On the other extreme, you had capital with zero labor. The efficient allocation is always somewhere in between. You want to give this. Now, when this happens, no skills get created. At the end of the day, a tailor in tailor shop remained a tailor in tailor shop. He never there was no, not enough capital and scaling up to specialize and create, therefore, these new skills. This was a very different model than what Korea did, what Taiwan did, what Singapore did, where actually you know, labor-intensive activities were initially uh, facilitated through good policies. Uh, workers move out of agriculture into these labor-intensive activities. I mean, take Korea, 1960, about you know, 70% of the workforce is in agriculture. By 1990, less than about 18% is left in agriculture. Rest has moved into industry and services. And during this process, uh, per capita incomes are rising. The wages are rising at 9, 10% a year in real terms. And moreover, skills are being created. You see, they, when they are working in the factory, skills get created in factories. We never had any factory culture except in these very large mills, for which then also any in investment in education basically ended up in engineering schools, in management schools, because if you're building steel mills, basically machinery mills, the chemical industry, this is what we did, uh, all your uh, 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 you know, educational resources had to be then invested in creating engineers and managers. So primary education got completely neglected. You had limited resources, you know, some, something had to give way. So this whole thing, and in that process, minds of the politicians, of the bureaucrats, of the entrepreneurs, they got hardwired to do only these you know, capital intensive, skill labor intensive industries. You go to CII today, you know, ask them. I sometimes tease them that, you know, uh, 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 do you all know who Harish Ahuja is? Nobody knows who Harish Ahuja is. Harish Ahuja is the largest exporter of apparel from India. And he single-handedly employs 120,000 workers. Nobody knows about this man. Why? Because we respect only who does the petroleum refining, big refinery, who produces automobiles, we know, who produces two-wheelers, we know, but other things we don't. So this is a whole, I think, you know, this is my sort of historical explanation that we got so hardwired to do these very highly capital intensive, skill labor intensive industries, our entrepreneurs are not interested. Stitching, who wants to do a stitching? But that's where the jobs are, that's where the large market is, the $500 billion market, world market where, and, and that's where you can employ a lot of workers with limited capital. So the capital for these guys are, is very expensive because much of the capital is taken by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the high end industries. So, Do you think, um, sorry, I'll, I'll just come to you. Do you think that this unhealthy obsession with uh, being the third, uh, my opinion, third largest economy in the world uh, in, you know, in GDP terms, ignoring uh, per capita income, right, 
uh, ignoring human development indices. You know, the, India's uh, literacy, for example, we've got large enrollments in school, but a level five student can't do the maths of level two, right? Uh, so there are huge gaps in outcomes. Um, so what do you think about that? Is it that should we not be concentrating on per capita income and what Niti Ayog is doing uh, now, uh, fortunately, looking at multi-diversional poverty, right? Which means, how do you change the conditions of people uh, on the lower level in terms of their, you know, water, electricity, uh, shelter, basic human needs? Uh, too much obsession with going big, big, big without looking at the quality of what we're doing. No, once again, I think for the for the um, uh, you know morale of the nation, these things matter to me. You know, becoming third largest that's a marker. That let's work a little harder, get there. Because in the end, per capita income rises because GDP rises. Or GDP rises because per capita income rises. I mean, look, 91, go back, you know, what was the per capita income? I mean, what was the per capita income? You know, we hardly could think. I mean, I left in 1974, and if I look back at the decade that, pre uh, that preceded that, 1964 to 1974, washed, there was no increase in per capita income over a 10-year period. I mean, maybe half percent per year. Nothing that you could actually see. Today, actually, you can see it. I mean, today, uh, you know, for anybody who was born in, uh, let's say, 2003 or 2004, 20 years later, I think your, your, your life has changed. Quite dramatically, it has changed. Uh, and, and, and that is with GDP and per capita GDP both rising simultaneously. Also, the other measures are very strongly correlated, which is why, as economists, we are quite comfortable measuring poverty in terms of per capita income. You know, the poverty line, which is only, in, you know, it's not looking at the other social indicators. But we know that there's a very high correlation between the social indicators and per capita income. That is not to say that we should not directly work on the social indicators, which we do also. But for that also, we need the revenues. Where are they going to come from? They're going to come from the economy growing. At the end of the day, uh, even 19, uh, you know, when, when uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was finance minister, effectively it was his complaint in those days that you know we haven't got enough revenues. How do we do uh, so much, so many of the social programs that we want to do? But because some growth happened, then Narega happened, then social uh, your Food Security Act happened. Uh, 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 you could invest in, in 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 toilets. You can invest in infrastructure, rural roads. Electricity, non jal, you know, bringing water to everybody. All this you could do precisely because the, the, the growth that has happened, which is GDP growth, has made these revenues available to the government, which were lacking. Yes, the, I mean, issue was also of inequality, right? I mean, you have 50% of the wealth being owned by 1% of the population in India. Inequality. Inequality. You may have GDP, you've got. 50% of the wealth being owned by 1% of the of the uh, population there, right? So you have growth, but you have uh, extreme poverty, right? Let uh, me ask you, let me ask you. Suppose I reduce inequality by exiling all the billionaires from India. Let's exile, put them into Boston. <laughs> would, you, would, would you be okay with that? No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, by just dividing it, you'll increase it. But growth also means that there should be some equality, equity in the growth, right? But, but are we getting a billionaire yeah. Raj also now, right? But Four or five uh, big industrialists controlling major industries in India. I, I, I don't buy that at all, actually, you know. I mean, controlling meaning what if... If, if, control, if, 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 if concentration of wealth. Only, only, if, only if there is no exports or imports, then they could control. Yeah. Anything that's traded, they've got to compete with the imports. Now, if the imports are being kept out by the, a prohibitive tariff or some sort of import license or something, that's a little different. Then, then there is a problem. But as far as the industry itself is concerned, it's got to compete in the global marketplace. It's an open market. So that part is, is, is clearly to me, is, is particularly for, for non-service, you know, for manufacturing. Certainly this is not an issue. I mean, free trade is the best uh, 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 antitrust to me. Now, services, 
banking, etc. You can argue, yeah, because these are often not fully globally traded uh, uh, products. So, so one can argue about that. Billionaires, as such, look, if there is wealth creation, there will be billionaire creation. If you know a better way to create wealth, I'm all with you. So, either you say that. Well, here is a path to creating wealth without creating billionaires. I mean, that's the path we tried actually with the, with the socialist model, that means of production, let's give it to the government, so there will be no, uh, no wealthy people. I mean, that was the whole idea at that time. But we tried that for 40 years and miserably failed, which is what led us to then this, these reforms, and whatever half-hearted, uh, embrace of the uh, uh, free markets uh, or, or, or a market economy, uh, and sure enough, then wealth, wealth uh, accumulation or wealth creation did actually accelerate. How many billionaires did, it, did we have? I never even heard of a dollar billionaire actually before 1990. <laughs> Maybe there were one or two, but, but I, I certainly one didn't hear of that. Today you got many, and that's because wealth has been created. Look, even if the wealth creator keeps 5% of the wealth that he or she has created for himself or herself, right. very quickly you get billionaires. Uh, and, and now, you know, also, you know, a billionaire cannot spend more than a tiny fraction, I mean, even with a $120 million wedding. That's a very tiny fraction of the wealth that the uh, person actually ends up spending on conspicuous consumption. Much of the wealth is invested. So it's all about investment at the end of the day. You can take that wealth away and give it to the government, but do you think that will improve the use of, the, uh, of that wealth or is it going to make it worse? I mean, at the end of the day, it's the productive investment of the wealth into... Uh, by the entrepreneurs who are the owners of the wealth. So uh, okay. uh, 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 we, we get very exercised by this, but the fact really is that at the end of the day, if, if wealth is being created and, 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 and it's, it's not the result of capture of, by the capture of the government, you know that you free on, on free go, you get a, get, get a mine and you're extracting the minerals and becoming rich. That's a little different. Uh, but, but as long as this is through creation of wealth rather than rent seeking, uh, I we think have to, we have to end at 5.15, is it? No, no, it's up to you, sir. You're, you're the boss here. What, what? No, no, I am happy to continue, but uh, it's all, all your schedule. So I saw you coming up, so, okay. Well, I'm sorry, I mean, You, uh, Dr. Larry, you wanted to say something? At the, uh, no, I just, you know, you asked this question about, about where will the jobs come from. Yeah. So just because exports today are low uh, doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. So the question is where will we be able to compete? I think which sector they will be able to compete, but I, th I think our big issue is productivity. We are, exports are not competitive, and uh, a lot of that is related to scale, and uh, including Shahi exports that you talked about which employs 120,000 people, it's spread over 50 plants. So they don't employ more than 2,000 people per plant. Uh, you go down to another firm like Matrix Exports, which is run by uh, uh, Gautam Nair, who's, you know, it's, it ha employs 10,000 people. How many plants? Five. No more than 2,000 people. These are, there's an order of magnitude difference in overall employment, but nobody wants an establishment size, even these big guys beyond 2,000. You look at the Bangladeshi big guys, they're operating five, 6,000 per person establishments. The Chinese big guys were operating 10, 12,000. And it shows in the time audits, just the time needed to uh, take a piece of cloth and cut it into the outline of a shirt. How much time does it take for a big Chinese firm? Seven minutes. You take even Shahi exports, 10 minutes. That's productivity difference, and that's related to size. Until you grow, but where that growth will come from? But the solution is that. I mean, if you have a huge army of, uh, of labor, which is just sitting there uh, in, in un underemployed agriculture, that's where these people have to go. But it's going to come from scale in manufacturing. Where it will be other? Well, <laughs> we could go on and on. So I'm, thank you, uh, Professor Pranagar.
Panagriya and uh, Dr. Leary. Uh, it's been really very insightful. I'm sorry uh, I took up too many of the questions, but that's the, the ilk of journalists. They can't stop asking questions. So, uh, thank, thank you very much. much. Actually, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much.